So there's this Jewish fable about two brothers, and these brothers have started a company together. Uh, they are producing flour, they're milling flour, and the company is doing well, and they decide amongst themselves that we should take what's left over every evening so that we have a storehouse of flour uh, in case things turn. And so every night they equally di distribute the leftovers, they put them in their storehouse, uh, and then one of the brother starts to think to himself, happily married, I have three children, I've got a wonderful life, I've got all I could ever ask for, and my brother lives alone, he should get a lot more of the flower than me. But he knew how proud his brother was, so he decided that in the middle of the night he would get up, and he would take some from his storehouse, and he'd cart it to his brothers, and secretly put it into his brother's storehouse. Meanwhile, at the other house, the single brother thinks to himself, my poor brother, he's got all of these mouths to feed, he's got a wife and several children, he needs a lot more flour than I do, but he's a pretty proud man. What I'll do is I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I will take from my storehouse and I'll go and I'll put it in my brother's. And this goes on for some time and both of them remark to themselves that this must be almost a miracle of sorts because the more they give away, the more it seems to stay the exact same. <laughs> and they keep doing this and they keep doing this. And then in the dark of night, as, as both brothers are doing what they're accustomed to doing, they meet. And all of a sudden, they realize what's been happening. And they throw their arms around each other and tears fall down their cheeks as they realize how much they have been loved by their brother. And God says, this place, this exact ground right beneath their feet, the place where love and grace collide and joy is, is, is rejoiced, this is where I want you to build my house, right here. Hope, right here at 73 Culpeper Street, where we have built God's house, is where that joy is celebrated, where grace and love collide, and our joy is overwhelming. I also hope this is the place that every time anybody comes through those doors, that they hear the story that we told today, the story of the prodigal, and I invite you to listen to it. Listen to it in our confession and absolution. Listen to it as we prepare for that meal. Listen to it in the words of the Eucharistic prayer. <clears throat> Listen to it as we say thank you and go out into the world. Hear all of the echoes of this story, the parable we tell today. And it's the parable that is called by some in the church the gospel within the gospel. It's a story that Dickens, Charles Dickens, calls the greatest story ever told. And it is a story about love and grace colliding and joy springing forth. It's a beautiful story. But it's a story that begins two parables before with the Pharisees and Sadducees arguing with Jesus about something that we're about to participate in. Who gets to eat dinner with Jesus? Who's invited to, to Jesus' dining room table and who Jesus chooses to dine with? And I know all of us are without blemish, so we're only halfway interested in what Jesus might have to say about who he dines with. But they're calling Jesus out because he dines with broken people. People who have made mistakes. People who have wrinkles and faults. People who are prostitutes and notorious sinners, tax collectors, and people who just feel broken. And at that time, who you ate with was who you were. They say you are what you eat. Back then, it was who you were willing to sit at a table with was who you were worth. And Jesus responds with three parables that kind of escalate. The first parable is about the worst shepherd that time has ever known. It's the parable of the 99 sheep that Jesus leaves behind to go and look for the one. A 99% retention rate for a shepherd is phenomenal. But this shepherd risks everything, all 99, to go and look for the one. And we go from that parable to another provocative parable where the, and 
go back to the first century with me, where a woman is placed in the person of God. And imagine how that rang with the people that heard it at the time. But we're all about shifting the way people think about God in this story. And this woman is looking for a coin that has hardly any worth whatsoever. It's the kind of coin that might even get sewed into a wedding dress. You couldn't buy much of anything with it. But she looks everywhere, and when she finds it, she's so excited, she throws an extravagant party that costs infinitely more than the coin that she found. These are getting more ridiculous by the minute. And then Jesus tells this story, the story of the prodigal. And I'm sure we felt like each person in this story at one point in time. But the story begins with a younger son. And this younger son, generally after his father has died, is entitled to one-third of the property. One-third of his value, and the older son usually gets two-thirds. That's the way the division of property back at the time was. And he goes up to his dad uh, and says, can I have my third now? Now that one-third isn't tucked in a 401k, it's in their property. And the property is where the mother and father, and the mother probably exists, but didn't get a whole lot of screen time in this telling, uh, are depending on that son to help take care of them. It takes the two boys to take care of all of these fields and to, to produce food so that the, uh, the, the, the mom and dad have something to eat. And with the, if the dad dies first, which was more customary, the mom has nothing apart from the boys to take care of. But that youngest son isn't concerned about this. He's not concerned about the shame that he bring about the family. He says to the dad, can we pretend you're dead? Can we act as if you are already dead and I get my third? Dad, for some reason, in such a pride culture, such a patriarchal culture, embarrasses himself by saying yes. And he puts a for sale sign on part of his property. So every neighbor knows the shame that this family is going through. He sells a third of his property and he gives it to the son. And the son goes off uh, and he spends it in dissolute living. Squanders it. Now, the beautiful Greek in this, listen to the Greek. He scatters his substance. Let that hang for a while. He scatters his very substance. Think of all the ways that we scatter our substance. The substance that God made us and all the ways that we scatter it. Not necessarily share it, but scatter it. He scatters his substance. When it's depleted, and we get the sense of how depleted it is because this is a faithful Jewish family and he is living with pigs. Think of the Jewish law and, and how that would be understood. In a Gentile land, living with pigs, he is starving and he's not going back to ask for, uh, for forgiveness because he is contrite, because he's realized how much he's hurt his mom and dad, because he really absolutely breaks for the things he's done wrong. He goes back because he's hungry. He goes back because he's hungry. And the dad, who has every reason to have washed his hands of that son, to say, you've brought such shame upon my family that I can't show my face with my neighbors. And remember, this is the image of God. You know, the big, mighty God in the heavens? This is the image of God that Jesus is portraying. And this father has never taken his eyes off the horizon. When he was still far off, the father sees him. The father never stopped looking for him. It says that his insides bounce up. The word for, uh, for that is, is, is intestinal pain, that it rose up inside of him, and he runs like a sprinter. This man has no shame. Aristotle says great men don't run in public. It was a humiliation to run in public for a man of his age, for a man of his stature, to go running in public. His ankles were shown, but he knew two things. One, he knew that his son who was lost had come back. And two, he also knew that his neighbors, because of how close they were as a community, his neighbors actually had a right where they could disown him. They actually could stone him to death and be okay, but they had a right where they could disown him where he would have to leave forever. And so he runs like a sprinter, throws his arm around him to protect him. And as the son mumbles over what he's rehearsed the whole way home about how to say, I'm sorry, he interrupts him and says, get our finest robe, get a ring, get sandals for his feet, throw, kill the fatted calf, let's throw a party. He doesn't even let him beg for forgiveness. He just throws his arms around. 
And we understand God's grace. We understand what we receive when all of us come to this table. Remember what I said about what the church should be. It should be a place where grace and love collide and joy is overflowing. We should welcome people in. We should break bread realizing that this is the moment that God throws God's arms around us. No matter what we've done, God says, you don't even have to say you're sorry. I know you are. And God welcomes us in and invites us to experience that joy. The boy's substance was scattered. But when God puts God's arms around him, when God feeds him with that bread and that wine, God fills up his substance with the true substance, the presence of the God in which he was created. Many can walk outside these doors and not scatter it, but share it. Let it spill out from his overflowing understanding of how much he is the substance of God, how much love he's been created with and how much love pours out. So I invite you every time you come to this table, every time you come to this place, see it as the intersection of grace and love and let it fill you with joy. And as people come in through those doors, remember that they may be just like that prodigal. And they may need to know that truth. Everything that you do to welcome them, make it look like that God with his arms outstretched, running out to throw, throw his arms around so that they too may realize their substance. And it may be filled up so that they can spill it out, share it with the world. Amen.